you know, Kelly broadcasts a lot of our meeting on grandalarmnews.com. So. Thank you for coming. I know it's hard to come here at night, and you know you're tired, a lot of you after work. But thank you. I think this is very important. This is our second or third second, second meeting at Grand Island Town Hall regarding Tonawana Cove and the study that we're doing. And we're helping the organization that Jackie leads tonight. You're going to learn more about that and why this study is important. Um, brief background. Does everyone know where Tonawanda Cove is? You know where that is? Those three towers across the way? For a long time, when I first came into office, people said, you know what? That's not a problem. The wind blows that way. We're not affected by that. I had leaders of the town tell me that. Well, that's not the case. We learned from the study that helped bring the prosecution against Tonawanda Cove that there were concentrations of pollution right here on Grand Island. One of the air filters or air monitors was placed at Beaver Island. And when the wind, wind blew that way, sometimes it would blow back. There would be an inversion effect where it would be concentrated here on Grand Island. So we did have severe levels of pollution right here. Now, I didn't know a lot about this. I just signed, kind of sensed some things about this, and I read some things in the paper. When I was elected, Jackie reached out to me. We had a meeting in my office. And she educated me about the dangers and the importance of the study. So why do we want to do a study like this? Well, we want to do a study because with more knowledge, we can protect ourselves against other polluters going forward. And then if there's action to be taken now against these companies, we can take that. Without that knowledge base, without that information, we're defenseless. But we can't get that knowledge base without your involvement. So that's why it's very important you came here tonight. This is a very important study. For too long, Western New York has been victimized by polluters all across Western New York. And actions like this by citizen groups is changing our community. And it's very important that you're involved to protect us, not just for now, but for the future, so we can't be taken advantage of. That area, the South Grand Island Bridge in Tonawanda, is one of the densest locations for air emissions in all of New York State. So it's not just Tonawanda Coke also. There's other, there's other sources of pollution that we need to be aware of. But Tonawanda Coke was particularly nasty. Now, we have with us today Jackie James Green. Jackie, she's going to do the presentation today. Jackie is a pioneer, a crusader, who helped stop Tonawanda Coke. She started by herself because she didn't feel good. And she thought, there's something wrong. I don't feel comfortable with that factory in my backyard. And she took some samples, and she figured it out herself. She tested herself. She armed herself with the knowledge. And she took down what was, at that time, an impenetrable, extremely strong, extremely formidable company. And she took them down for one of the biggest actions against a polluter in the history of our country. So she's a great example that we can look to. She's going to give us more information today. I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize Mr. Sean O'Neill in the back here. Mr. Sean O'Neill is from Senator Jacob's office. Can you stand up for a second, Sean? <laughs> so... I would like to say how thankful I am to see Sean here, because as a Democrat, it's fantastic. And I think this is the first time for one of these meetings we had a Republican leader, or representation of a Republican leadership in the, in the, in the audience. So thank you, because this is now a bipartisan effort on Grand Island to help fight this. So a round of applause, everybody. Thank you to Senator Jacobs' office. So with that, I would so much thank you for coming out. This is an important meeting. I'm very excited. Don't take it the wrong way. When I step down the stairs, there's an economic advisory board meeting I need to go to. But I'm so thankful that you're here. And come on up, Jackie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor. And uh, my name is Jackie James Creedon. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Tonawanda Coke story, the history, where we are today, and about the studies, the health study, and the soil study, and then where are we going from here. This story continues. It started back in 2001. And before I do that, uh, I just want to say welcome everybody. Katie is our community organizer. So if you have any additional questions, both of us will be around to answer any questions. And we have Taylor in the back. She's 
helping to sign everybody in. So um, I just wanted to uh, say, you know, make sure you know who everybody is as well. So this is a, a long journey. It started in 2001. I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and fibromyalgia is a neuromuscular disorder, and no one knows what causes it. It is um, basically, for lack of better words, I hurt all the time. My muscles hurt, and there, it, no one knows what causes it. And I wanted to find out what caused it. I, I started wondering, you know, I have this horrible disease and I just don't, I hurt all the time, I can't sleep, I have anxiety, I'm, you know, I'm going, I was actually going through a divorce, trying to raise two kids on my own, and I was, I just wanted to find out some answers, and, and this is, uh, I'm going to tell you the story here today, and, um, and the story continues, by the way. So, um, this was January of 2002. I saw this article from the Buffalo News, and I thought, wow, uh, these people are saying they're sick. Maybe, maybe this is why I'm sick. This is, uh, I reached out to these people, and they were workers from a company called Lindy. And it's currently, it's Praxair, and they're a company in Tonawanda. And Lindy had processed uranium for the atomic bomb. And these workers felt that they were sick because of the exposure to uranium as they worked there. And they also believed that the environment was sick, too, that there was contaminants in the ground and the water. And there was this large article, it was front page, Buffalo News, and it was also linked up with a New York State Department of Health study that came out in 1999. And it said certain cancers were statistically elevated. And so, again, it started with these people's story, my own story. And then I noticed other people had stories of illnesses, too. And it was also backed up with some scientific evidence. So we wondered, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. So the New York State Department of Health came to town it was about 2002, and they presented their findings, and they said, well, you know, people are sick in this community, but it's not related to uranium exposure, so, okay, our job is done. And I thought, what? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> are you telling me you're just going to leave us high and dry? So at that point, I became pretty angry, and I said, you know what, I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out why we're all so sick. Then soon after that, I met Adele. Adele is on the far right. And I was speaking out at a function, it was in 2003, and she approached me afterward and she said, you know, I wonder if it's something in our air that's making us sick. I can't go outside. I have to watch to see what way that wind is blowing to walk my dogs, because if it's blowing a certain way, I don't go outside because I get headaches and I get nauseous. She says, I'm really convinced that it's something in our air. And I said, well, maybe it is. And she said, well, you know, I've heard of this one method that we can collect an air sample with the Home Depot bucket. So we explored it a little bit further and sure enough, we made our own air sampler out of a Home Depot bucket. And one night in August of 2004, we went outside and we collected an air sample outside of Tonawanda Coke. But this is way before we knew that the culprit was Tonawanda Coke. In Tonawanda, there's 53 air regulated facilities. So there's a lot of facilities that are emitting pollution into our environment. So we had no idea. We just collected an air sample at the time. And uh, we also met up with uh, two other people and this was uh, the four of us. We started the Clean Air Coalition of Western New York, which I'm sure most, most of you know that name today. So we had that scientific data from the air sample. We found benzene, but it was just one sample. It wasn't, we didn't think it was gonna get us anywhere, but you know what? It did get us the attention of a New York State DEC engineer. We took that data to him and we said, look, we found something here. Does this mean anything? 
And he said, well, you know what, let me go ahead and take a couple of my own air samples. He went out, he took a couple air samples, and sure enough, it confirmed what we got in our bucket. And um, from there, he said, well, you know, I think we should, we, we might have something here. And I think, let's, let's try to work together here and, and find out if, if something is up with this. So they applied for an EPA grant and were awarded a grant back in 2007 to monitor the air for one year for air toxins. And there were four high-tech air monitors placed. One of them was on Grand Island. And you see that picture on the left. That's the, the, the trailer that housed the equipment to measure the air pollution. That was the, the trailer that was placed on Grand Island. Okay, there were three other ones in Tonawanda. So they measured, the t from 2007 to 2008, they measured the, year, the air for one year. And at the end of that, the New York State DEC and EPA came to Tonawanda to present their findings. And what they found is that, sure enough, it confirmed what we found in our bucket several years before, that benzene levels were high in the community, number one. And number two is that Tonawanda Coke Corporation was the source of this benzene. So now, at this point, here, you know, I'm just, I'm just a mom, a single mom, trying to raise a couple kids, and my background is, I have a BS in chemistry, and I thought, oh my gosh, now we have this data, right? This is the smoking gun. Uh, this is it. We're, you know, we're going to get, a, you know, everything's going to happen. Um, well, what do you think the answer to this question is? <laughs> Was that enough? No, it wasn't enough. <clears throat> So what we did after that is we actually, we wrote letters to J.D. Crane, the owner of Tonawanda Coke, and we asked to meet with them because, okay, without a doubt, there's this benzene coming from your facility. Let's meet up and we'll talk about it. And we were rejected. And we had the support of our senators at the time and many more elected officials, Gillibrand and um, Schumer wrote J.D. Crane and they said, you know, you need to meet with the community. Did he meet with the community? No, he wouldn't meet with us. So we said, all right, if you're not going to meet with us, we're going to come to you. And we decided to protest outside the gates of Tonawanda Cope. We wanted to be heard. So sure enough, uh, our protest was very successful. We had phenomenal news coverage. And... This is the article in October of 2009. We are on the front page, Buffalo News. And Aaron Mango is the a lawyer, a, a U.S. assistant attorney for the Department of Justice. And he doesn't get the Sunday paper. But he just so happened to go over his parents' house that day. And he saw this, this paper on his parents' table. And it immediately caught his attention. And the two things that he read that caught his attention were highlighted here. And um, note that that person, by the way, is from lives on East River Road on Grand Island. Lovisa Anderson. So he noted that how many people were ill and how they were they had passed away. People's stories, again. And the second part of this is that he noted that this, again, was from the one-year study, the EPA and New York State DEC study, that Tonawanda Cope was emitting benzene at 75 times the guideline limit. So that was in 2009. Um, from there... The Department of Justice, Aaron Mango, sent an email. After he saw that news article, he sent an email immediately the next day to Washington, D.C. and said, we have to investigate this company. I think that there's something going on here. So they contacted Tonawanda Coke, and they asked them to provide them with some documents. Tonawanda Coke refused to send any documents to the Department of Justice. You don't do that to the federal government. 
If the federal government comes after you and asks you to hand over documentation, you do. If you don't, you're in big trouble. And Tanawanda Cope found out the hard way because at the end of December, a couple days before Christmas, the Department of Justice and the U.S. Coast Guard went in there with guns and took out those documents they wanted. They also arrested the environmental manager, Mark Camholtz, and took him out in handcuffs. Okay. So from there, they, the company and the Mark Camholtz were indicted on several charges for breaking environmental laws. But as you can see, from 2007 to 2000, or 2009 to 2013, there were many, that, that's, that takes a long time, but the slide previous to this, we felt that there was something else coming off of that company besides benzene. Many, many people were complaining about black soot and like a black gooey substance coming from the air and landing on their cars and burning holes in the paint on their cars and burning their vegetation. And we felt that there could be another contaminant coming off of this com company that, that was endangering our, the welfare. So how many people know when I talk about black soot interfering with their quality of life on their pool covers out there? Yes, okay. It was a big problem. And we felt that there was possible contamination on the outside of that black soot that was endangering, um, you know, either people were breathing it in or that it was in the, their yards, in the soil of their yards. So we decided to take some soil samples. We took 30 samples, some of them on Grand Island, by the way, and we found, what did we find? We found contamination again. But we knew for us to, to link the contamination here to a certain company or source, that's, we can't do it with 30 results. We knew we needed a comprehensive soil study as well, just like what we had with the air a comprehensive one-year air study, we needed a soil study as well, okay? So then, now, going back to the, the case, uh, on March 28, 2013, they were uh, found guilty in front of a jury, and I must say one thing, too, is that normally 98% of these cases, when the federal government comes after you criminally, if you're criminally negligent, you settle out of court because you know darn well you're probably going to lose. And Taiwan and Cope would not settle. They fought and fought. And guess what? They were found guilty in federal court for breaking the Clean Air Act and other environmental laws. So finally, we got something. And uh, this was in 2014, so there was a year in between when they were found guilty and before they were sentenced. And it all came down to this one day and this one judge, Judge William Scratton. And uh, it felt surreal at the time. It was uh, just, everybody was in the courtroom. It was, it was so crowded. There was another room with a TV monitor. And um, we were all waiting to hear what Judge Scratton had decided. And what he had decided is, is the following. Uh, they were they were fined $12.5 million. And we also got $12.2 million in community projects. Um, he said, without a doubt, this community has been harmed. But we don't understand the extent of the harm. So that this is why I'm funding the University of Buffalo $11 million health study and the soil study that our group submitted was also funded because going back to those soil tests that I was told you about is that in that year between sentencing and um, their conviction, the judge in the case asked for, for projects. We submitted our projects with the data we had and he funded it. So these, these two studies I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Um, on another note, they were, the EPA also went after the company for civil violations. And we also have an additional $1 million coming to our community for community projects that is still yet to be determined. And 
Oh, the environmental manager went to jail. That was a big thing. That's never happened in the history of the United States that somebody went to jail for an environmental crime. Okay, that, that message sent a clear message loud and clear across the country. Most important, 92% reduction we have in our community. And the health study. So it's a 10 year study. It, it, it's going to be, uh, we need 38,000 residents to, to participate. Uh, it's a biomonitoring study, which what it means is that we'll be taking blood and urine and testing uh, you know, your blood and urine to see what, what people have been exposed to, what chemicals they've been exposed to. So hopefully we'll start be able to making the links. You know, we know that Tonawana Coke was polluting. We know that there was high levels of benzene coming off the company. But at this point, and we have the stories and some evidence from the cancer surveillance studies. So we're hoping to make some links then with this study. But it's going to take a while. It's a 10 year study. Okay. We also have an environmental health education center. We've already set that up. It's with our offices. It's on Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore. So it, you're welcome to visit anytime. It's right off of the expressway. And um, we're going to have all sorts of different programs for the community, and it'll be free for, for everyone. Um, hopefully, you know, yoga, meditation, cooking classes, things like that. Okay? So, this is another important piece of information I wanted to put in here. This is showing you the air pollution and the boundaries and how far and wide the pollution of Tanawana Coke has migrated. And if you notice that almost all of Grand Island has been impacted by this pollution. All right, Tonawanda Coke is located in, you know, right here. Okay. So you see that's, uh, that's pretty concerning. Okay. Uh, the other community service project that was funded is our, the soil study, the comprehensive soil study. And <clears throat> There will be, where, as I explained, the health study is 10 years. This is a two-year project. All right, so we're well on our, on our way into it. Uh, we will be testing about 300 points this summer. We're starting to canvas in a couple weeks. We'll be going door to door, telling people of the study and asking them if they'd like their yard tested for these contaminants. And next year, phase two, we'll be going back to the areas where there potentially could be hot spots. Okay. So what are we going to need? Now, this is the grid, and this is the preliminary grid. It's not set in stone. We're actually going to be starting testing the southeast border in Kenmore to see how far the pollution, you know, see if the grid needs to go east, west, north, south. And um, again, here is the preliminary grid for Grand Island. Again, they could go north a little bit or, or west. Okay. <clears throat> we need people to volunteer their yards. Okay. We also have an, an advisory committee already set up. And the advisor, advisory committee is, um, is acting as a liaison between U University of Buffalo and Fredonia, who's running the study and the community. Okay, now this is, um, I told you about the health study and the soil study and how important it is for you to become involved and in that. Um, another piece of information that is very important, uh, I talked to a lot of people and they think that Tonawana Coke is closed up. They're not. They're operating. If you notice, look at the date on this. This was just a couple weeks ago. A resident had taken this and noted that the smell was really bad. So we took this information, we sent it to the New York State DEC, and they, at this point, they had to go through their lawyers. So it took a couple weeks. I just heard a couple days ago, on this date right here, they had lost power. Tonawana Coke had lost power. And how this system works is that it's a continuous system. The, 
and, and they need, if they lose power, it's a big deal because then it, it's a pressure, 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 you know, increases and then it has to be released somewhere. And so they lost power. They went to put on their backup generator. And guess what? Their generator was broken. <sighs> so they had to release this pressure. So guess where they released it? Into our lungs. That's where it went. So they're still at it. Okay? So it's important, it's absolutely important that we remain vigilant. If I know you live on Grand Island, but if you go that way, you can see it from the expressway, go right before you go over the bridges. You know, just take a look over there. If you see black smoke coming off of there, you know, please, maybe get off the expressway for five minutes, take a photograph and report it. Very important. That's it. Why is the environmental guy in jail and not the owner? It's a good question. People seem to think that he was the fall guy. Mm -hmm. But you know what? He was he did uh, the big count against him it was obstruction of justice. So there was a pressure release valve in the system. Um, like I, I explained to you about the pressure, right? And it was spewing out all these horrible gases. And it was unregulated, mean, meaning that when you, if you're a company and you want to uh, release toxins or pollution into the environment, you have to get a permit to do so. And Tonawanda Coke did not have a permit for this point. And they tried to conceal it from the regulators. Mark Hamholtz told, directed one of his employees, he said, you can't have that go off when the regulators are here. And they try, he tried to conceal it mm -hmm. from the regulators. And that's what, why he went to jail. Do you have any idea how many years you were doing this? Well, Tonawanda Coke, J.D. Crane purchased the company. The company's been in operation for about 100 years. J.D. Crane purchased it in 1978, so a very long time. Uh, another interesting statistic is that from, and it's on a brochure, from 2007, we don't have, we have only statistics recently, but we don't know how long it's been going on, but we think it's been going on for a long time. 2007 to 2009, they, Tonawanda Coke was reporting uh, emissions of was it one ton? Oh my gosh, one one ton per year at a rate of one ton per year. They were actually emitting benzene at 91 tons per year. No, five tons. Five tons. They were reporting five tons per year, and they were actually emitting 91 tons of benzene per year. It's it's just. It's no, not yet. The Environmental Health Education Center is up and going, um, but the health study is not. I mean, we're collecting names and people for people interested. Soil study is ongoing right now. You said that um, people would be canvassing neighborhoods starting in a few weeks. Where are they going to start? In Kenmore. Okay. Mm -hmm. When would we be able to expect? Them coming across the bridge here soon. <laughs> if you're interested in getting your soil tested, um, feel free to shoot either one of us an email, and we'll put you on the list when we're ready to contact this area. So we have to have those 300 points by June. Would you recommend uh, the, the people that want to get involved for a soil sample be people that already live on the southeastern side of the island? I mean, I would presume you don't want to start with someone that's on the north end, right? Right. So if you if you remember those that grit that if you could bring that up, there you go. Again, it's right. I don't think we're probably going to go way up north right. on Grand Island. Again, it might move, like I said, a little bit north, maybe a little bit west. Um, it depends on I I 
I believe what we'll probably do is, again, this is being directed by UB and Fredonia. Um, they're, they're probably going to want to test maybe the boundary here, you know, or here, and see what we find first. And if we find contamination here, then they might move it a little bit or not. Yes. The other map where you showed the larger yellow circle, right. that air contamination? That was the air contamination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would go almost through the entire island. That was, and, and the health study is very inclusive. So anyone that wants to partake in the health study, we're, we're saying, you know, come. So if we do want to do that, is that the 10-year study where yes. we get results until after 10 years? We'll be, re that they, you <laughs> will be releasing information and results you know, throughout those 10 years. Um, but, you know, it's just, is a, unfortunately, it's just a long process. And by the way, Tonawata Coke appealed these studies because they didn't want to, from what I understand, is they did not want to open themselves up to additional liability. Right. Because, you know, if they're found, if we find contamination in our backyards, and we can link that to Tonawata Coke, they don't they didn't want that. <laughs> Sorry, Sharon, Shannon? So if you ask for a soil study at your house and you find contaminated, where does that leave you as a person to deal with that problem? Right, that's a good question. So um, and we understand we've been talking about that continuously for the last couple of days. Uh, we we intend to support <laughs> Our community people. I live in the area too. I live in Kenmore. Um, and with resources and information and depending on what we find, we'll be pushing for a remediation of our soil. But we don't know what that is. It's, it's extremely important that we have the support of our, of our elected officials. And because if it gets to that point, um, we need their support to push, you know, for funding for that possibility. Will that affect your house when you go to sell it? Because you just got a sample and it says it's contaminated and I already have to share my house that, you know, that cancer. So I'm just, like, do you decide to do that or do you not decide? Do you just live there because you're like, well, we already had it, hopefully we're good now, but we're not. Right, so it's a very, it's a personal um, question and you know, we can't tell you what to do. We can just give you the information. And um, the additional piece of information is that if you do go to sell your house, there is a disclosure on there. And it's, it, one of the questions is, if you had environmental testing on your property, <coughs> and you would be, you would have to say yes. I mean, you would you have to say that. Now, you know, you might, the results might come back, it might be clean too. You might find nothing. So, I don't know. Exactly. That's a really, really good point because if you have your yard tested, but we're testing several more yards in your whole neighborhood, so it just doesn't depend on the one test in your backyard. It, it really, it, it's all of it together, all that information together. And it can be cleaned up. Yes, and it can be cleaned up. So, um, you know, Let's try to move forward here and make a positive. I, this is a sort of a, this is a negative thing, and I know it's not easy for me to deliver some of this information. <laughs> um, but let's you know try to make a positive out of, out of it. We're all in this together, okay? No, for sure. But does any of the money that they were fined go towards remediation? No, because we don't know if remediate. We don't know if their pollution has gone in people's backyard. We think maybe it has, but we don't know. So would that be part of like a double jeopardy type situation? Like can they... Well, we would, we 
could potentially go after them after we okay. have the information. Yes. Okay. So it could be and we would person. intend to do that. If they are found that it's their contamination coming from them in our backyards, yes, we will, they should pay for it. For sure. Yes. So if you don't have the study done and four of your neighbors have had it done, they, their yards can be cleaned, but yours wouldn't be part of that. Oh, no, no, no. It would be the whole area. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there's been many stories like that. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, several times um, they would, there were episodes that happened. There was an episode happened a year and a half ago where an employee died and they kind of want to cope. Uh, it was it was an accident that could have been prevented, and this gentleman died. This employee died because of their negligence. Mm -hmm. So there's, believe me, I've heard stories upon stories. <laughs> how, how are they staying open? That's what yeah. we're all yeah. wondering. Uh, they're sued millions and millions. I don't understand how they're still open. That's a good question. Um, they. They recently gave $12 million away, mm -hmm. or $2 million, $1 million to explore the new Explorer Moore Museum that's going to open in downtown Buffalo, and the other one to Damon College. And the Environmental Institute at Damon College. <laughs> <laughs> How ironic is that? We actually sent out a press release. Uh, if you look that up, that was just a couple months ago. That was in December, mm -hmm. a couple months ago, and uh, we were quoted as saying, well, you know, there's no doubt that this money is going to two worthy causes. However, doesn't it make logical sense that that money goes to help your own neighbors and your own community first, right? But I guess that's not what was going on in his mind. Can I ask another question? You would mentioned early on that there are 53 air-regulated facilities in our backyard. Is it possible to, to scientifically prove that the chemicals that are polluting our yard and our person are from Tonawanda Coat? We hoped to answer that, yes. Okay. And again, this is why they did not, they kept on appealing these studies okay. and they lost. Um, okay. That's when the funding has been released. Okay. Yeah, um, we actually, for the soil study, uh, we have a uh, right to access their property to gain a sample from their property. And we're going to take that and hopefully, you know, for like better words, like fingerprint, that chemical composition. And based on that fingerprint, uh, then as we go and test people's yards, we'll see if, pe you know, people's yards have the same fingerprint. So. Has um, that been done yet? Do you know which chemicals you're looking for specifically? No, this that hasn't been done yet. So back in 1978, the three of us, all kids, born, raised in Grand Island, all came up with different cancers in the age of 20. all lived within four houses of each other on North Town and East River and Six. So, you know, we, we were born there, raised there, graduated from Grand Island, and we all popped up with this cancer that we're, we're just uh, wondering what's going on. And are they going to be able to go back that far? And with the sampling, of course, even if you don't live there, mm -hmm. um, my parents don't live in North County anymore. Right. But um, mm -hmm. her parents do. According to all about six or eight people in that same neighborhood. Right. And they all got a few of them. So we all grew up together. You know, that same period. So we're kind of the same. In 25 to 30 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's our concern. Within a six house radius of each of us. And 
and we were out by sweat when we all took off the train every day. <laughs> Do you remember the air pollution? Do you remember? Because kids, we never paid attention to that. We were in the river. We right. in the creeks. In the creeks. And, you know. uh -huh. On certain days, well, is the first line of saying is that it also, it's, I mean, I'm wondering why I was sick and look at like where this whole story has led, right? And the, the story continues. Well, I initially thought, you know, what happened to me? And then what happened to my neighbors in Tonawanda? And then it started growing and growing. And, you know, I never really even thought that ta the, at the beginning when we were the Clean Air Coalition that Grand Island was affected. And then I started hearing these stories from Grand Island residents, especially on East River Road. And they would say that when there was hardly any wind, something would happen called inversions. All right. So you have like a, a low cloud cover, like no wind, and a lot of times this happens in the summertime. And so they pollute, and the, the pollution couldn't go up any or go anywhere, so it would just sit and would migrate just to that whole area, which would include Grand Island and East River Road. And um, we feel that, I, I don't know, again, this is just my hunch is that that is really how a lot of Grand Island residents were impacted on these inversion days, and, and severely. Um, the neighborhood they're talking about is right across from this, actually. Right across from Blue Water Marina, it's right there. In fact, right. That guy got sick, too. Mm -hmm. um, it's just right across, so there's no doubt. That it's right, so coal carbon emissions don't only have benzene, they have like a hundred different chemicals in them, and they're they're a hazardous air pollutant, an, an EPA hazardous air pollutant that cause cancer. I mean, it's a known fact. So it's not only the benzene; it's the coke. If you ever have a chance to do a little research on coke oven emissions, you'll find out. Wow, you know, they're really dangerous, and they were not regulated. Right. There's these coke, there's a few of these coke facilities across the country, and they had pollution control equipment on them. And instead of J.D. Crane, instead of doing the right thing and putting pollution control equipment on his plant, he would fight every single time and try to get away from the regulators. He fought and fought and fought. He has this whole history of owning these coke facilities, these Foundry coke facilities, in places like Detroit and other places in, in, in the Midwest. And it, it, if you get a chance, Google him too. He, as soon as the regulators started coming after him, instead of doing the right thing or paying the fines or putting in pollution control equipment, he'd skip town. He'd close the facilities and leave town, and he left these people with a mess that he never paid for. So here he is in Tonawanda, doing the same old thing that he was has been doing for 50 years, all right, fight, fighting, 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 and guess what? His day came in court. All right, so my point is, is that we caught this guy, finally. I mean, that's, I, I know we're left with what we're left with, and but we have to move forward. And we have other people, other community groups across the country are looking to us as an example. Okay? And in these days and times, with the current political climate, I mean, it's now more than ever that we have to be armed with these tools to test our own air, soil, and water. Because we're not going to be able to rely on the government to do that bad job anymore. We need to rely on ourselves. That will be included in the health study, and uh, we are bound in what we can say so far about it because they're, they're, um, the
the, the professors that are, the researchers that are involved, um, they're getting their final IRB approvals. So um, I really, I don't feel comfortable with answering a lot of specific questions regarding the health study. If we, we could take your information and then we'll provide you with information when it, we can. Okay, but you know, it all started back in 2000. 2002 and this is what we wanted back then and we have our health study so it's a good, really good thing yep. I want to thank you for doing what you did um, for the community um, I ask if this presentation is available on your website well we can make it it's sure. on uh, Grand Island Are you talking about the PowerPoint? Yeah, this, this, oh, this yeah. presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people would find uh, that very interesting and want to know more about it. Okay. Um, and I was wondering, are the air tests continuing? Yes, so that's a good question. Uh, there are still two air monitors uh, in place. And if you remember that slide that was up here on February 18th, mm -hmm. um, so the really cool thing about it was, okay, so those air monitors, there's one uh, just outside the gates of Tonawanda Coke, and there's one um, downwind in the city of Tonawanda. And they collect air once every six days for 24 hours. So um, that day that they were polluting our environment again, um, the air monitor was going that day. So we'll actually have data mm -hmm. to see Yes. And are, so is the DEC finding these people constantly? Well, they will, tr they, yes, they have. I mean, this particular incident was just, you know, happened. So those, if they're, they are found, they call it a violation, um, it, then they will, you know, but it, it takes a while. Uh, that was, that's a good question. <laughs> right. So, I agree. I agree. But uh, that's why we're having discussions about resurrecting our buckets, our bucket brigade. So you want to be armed with your own air sample? Okay. All right. Let's do it. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks okay. so much. GI Square, but it's through Grand Island. Grand Ideas for Grand Island. And uh, Neil Gallagher actually runs the group. He's in the back corner there with this little girl. Um, so we've been trying to do a lot of things like this. It's just, it's a grassroots uh, group that we started. I know it's been somewhere throughout the island, you know, that it's politically motivated or we have politicians involved and that's absolutely not true. Neil and I can tell you that we've had, at one time we did have some politicians speak at one meeting, but since then, it's just a bunch of us, we sit around and talk about, you know, what's going on in the island, maybe some things we can get involved in that. But I was thinking that maybe we, um, through uh, GI Square, could start maybe getting a list where people could maybe get a hold of us. They could private message us and we could start trying to get a list of people that feel they've been affected on Grand Island and where they're located and whatnot. So maybe that's somewhat of a start on the island. You know, it's going to be tough. It's going to be decide every house is maybe going to look at this differently. Some people want to be tested. Some people won't. You know, my hope is that they will because I, my fear is this is a lot further and a lot bigger than we know. I mean, it's still continuing. I can't believe this company is even open. It's maddening to me when I came here in December and, and heard this meeting. I walked out of here like, I was shocked that, that a lot of us that I didn't know, and it's, it's not because of Jackie and her team. They have done so much. I mean, they've been doing this for years, and if it wasn't for her, I don't know where we would all be at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just got over a chest cold. So, but, you know, everybody, we, we all, you all make your own health choices and, and how you want to take care of yourself, but you shouldn't have to be worried about what the air is out there. We shouldn't be worrying about what the, our kids are breathing. I mean, and 
the fact that this is going on, it's been going on, it keeps going on. So I hope to bring as much awareness through Grand Island. I'm just a messenger, but I'm going to try to get out as much as I can. And uh, if anyone has questions, my name's Jen Pusatier, by the way. So um, I'll be willing to pass things on and, and, and do whatever I can if I find it frustrating. So I'm going to try to do my best. So thanks for everybody for coming out tonight. I hope you got some information out of it. So thank you. Thank you.